I watched Don't Look Up a few days ago and started crying after. Needless to say, I enjoyed the message behind the film, despite it sending me into an existential crisis. And it's not as if I didn't already know everything conveyed in the film. I was already very aware of the impending doom of the climate crisis, the manipulation and money obsession in politics, the difficulty of collective action, the focus on trivial celebrity drama over truly important news. I knew about all of these problems, but I think that's part of the purpose of this film. We know everyone knows, but does anyone care? Does knowledge prompt anyone to act? That's why I don't think it's enough for people who dislike this film to say that it's because the message of the film was too blatant, that it was too obvious what the message or analogy was. Zishan Alim from MSNBC wrote, I sometimes felt screamed at for something I already know. In a similar fashion, David Fear from The Rolling Stone wrote, As for DiCaprio and Lawrence, they both take turns channeling the voice of the movie's creator, yelling and bellowing and losing their cool repeatedly over the fact that no one seems to get it. We keep blowing whatever little chances we have to fix this. It's a sentiment familiar to a lot of us, so much so that at a certain point, you want to throttle this movie back and match it decibel for decibel. No need to keep screaming this in our faces. But contrary to what these two criticisms say, I think it needs to be obvious. The frustration, the corruption need to be in our face more. The film isn't trying to teach us something new or reveal something unknown. It is trying to make the gravity of a situation so clear and obvious that we cannot ignore it or treat it as some random fact we keep in our heads. I do not study film, so I am not here to talk about film techniques such as pacing, dialogue, etc. I'ma leave that to people who understand that field. What I want to discuss is some of the philosophy underlying this movie and why I think it's really important. But first, let's address a question that a lot of people have had. Is a comet a good enough analogy for climate change? I think it's fair for people to be wary about whether a deadly comet accurately represents climate change because they do differ. Some say that people fail to act on the climate crisis because it is not a tangible, immediate thing. It is a gradual, slow process that can often go unnoticed in wealthier communities, which have the infrastructure to escape its initial impacts. And because it's slow and gradual, it's bound to get less attention in our society, which is wired for short-term thinking. Fast trend cycles, political leadership changing every few years, instant gratification from consumerism. The deadly comet, on the other hand, is a tangible thing with a clear and close state of impact which will cause the same end for all at the same time. But I don't think this scrutiny around whether the analogy is perfectly accurate or not is that important when it comes to the fundamental message of the film. The threat could have been a comet, a killer creature, a chemical, a pandemic, perhaps? The only aspect of the climate crisis that should be maintained in the analogy of the film is the fact that climate change is debatable and insensible. This is what creates the potential for disagreement and thus division between citizens, leading to the inability to actually act on anything. So Randall, we're hearing that there is no comet or that there is a comet, right. that it's a good thing, or maybe it's a bad thing. We are so confused. This lack of agreed upon truth is what allows politicians to shape their reactions based on what is favorable, not what is true. They want you to look up because they are looking down their noses at you. So yes, even though there are differences between a comet and climate change, what's necessary for Don't Look Up's main point is there. In fact, the choice of a comet makes sense to me since the film is supposed to be satire. Over-exaggeration is a common tool used in satirical pieces to bring out the shortcomings of the target. It's as if the film is saying, hey, 
Even when there's this extinction-causing comet we can track with nearly 100% accuracy, even when we can literally see it in the sky, we are still pointing our fingers at each other and prioritizing Riley Bina's concert. Perhaps you think the analogy is unrealistic, that of course we would band together and take out the threat if it were a deadly comet. Sure, I get that. But the over-exaggeration may be intentional. So, what is this fundamental message that I've been yammering on about? You do understand that this is an apocalyptic event. This is, this is a large oh. celestial body heading. What does it mean to be authentic? A lot of existentialist philosophy deals with this question. To answer it, we begin with their idea that all human beings possess a fundamental freedom. The philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre famously said, man is condemned to be free. Most people hold freedom in the highest regard. But these existentialist philosophers saw that we actually hate being too free. To be fundamentally free means that you have no set purpose to your life, no determined path you must follow. When people say things like, I was born to be an actress, existentialists would shake their head and say, no, you were simply born to be. Your identity as an actress came afterwards. You could switch to any career tomorrow and that would not change who you are because who you are is defined alongside the choices you make and it is being constantly shaped. Existence is never static. To live authentically then is to exercise this fundamental freedom. I can't go into too much detail about this because that deserves its own video, but just think for a second about having infinite unlimited freedom, being responsible for your mistakes, of knowing that you have the liberty to leave an unfulfilling marriage, pursue a different career, start your homework earlier. It's not always wise to do whatever you want with your freedom, because obviously some choices may lead to better consequences than others, but the potential to act freely is always at every human's core. Existentialists say that we are scared of our ultimate freedom and our responsibility for our free actions, that we try to root ourselves in restricted, repetitive forms of activities and relationships. Think of our bureaucratic institutions that have very rigid technical processes of how things are to be done, the routines we are subjected to in school or workplaces, or personal checklists for daily tasks we ought to complete. Big tech plays a huge role in trying to avoid uncertainties. In this scene, Peter, the head of Bash Cellular, talks about how his technology can predict and know everything about you. Or so it seems. Peter says Professor Mindy will die alone, but Mindy actually ends up dying alongside his loved ones. And I think that this indicates the importance of recognizing that our existence is not set in stone. In an attempt to control our endless possibilities, responsibility, and unexpected change, we live an inauthentic existence because we are not acknowledging the freedom at our core. We end up clinging to habits, to people, to ideas of how things should be done or the way we should be. And this is so much easier than actively recognizing and exercising our freedom because then we don't have to deal with anxious thoughts such as, what am I supposed to do with my life? Who am I? What should I believe? We instead have traditions, partners, companies, political parties. They tell us. I think this is at the heart of Don't Look Up. Don't Look Up versus the Just Look Up sides are both full of people who chose their side based off of external influences. The Don't Look Up crowd is shown to be full of President Orlean supporters who chose to believe the comet is fake because of their loyalty to their party, while the Just Look Up side is probably full of Riley Bina fans who chose it because that's where their favorite singer stands. People did not use their own freedom to pick their side. Another example is when Professor Mindy says that he has no choice but to go along with the president and bash cellular's plans. And Dr. Oglethorpe reminds him that Man's always got choices, Randall! But Professor Mindy has to recognize his ability to make that choice. One of my favorite parts of the movie is when Professor Mindy does finally exercise his freedom. He breaks free of the idea that there is no other choice when he screams on the daily rip. Right place because on this show we like to say things. Oh, would you please just stop being so fucking pleasant? 
Okay, so let's get back to the idea of us wanting to control reality. Inevitably, we run into dissonance between what we are trying to control reality to be and what authentic reality actually brings us. For example, maybe you've seen babies suck on random objects as if it were their mother's breast. They are hungry, and so they preconceive a breast to be there. But the negative realization is that there is no breast, no titty today. And if we have too low of a tolerance for negative realizations, in other words, a low tolerance for a reality that's different from what we had planned for or hoped for, then we are likely to ignore authentic reality and continue to act as though what we had planned to happen is happening. Again, that's inauthentic. Unfortunately, the way our society is structured nurtures a low tolerance for negative realizations. The presentation from Bash Cellular shows that their latest phones are designed to always keep their users happy. No negative feelings are allowed to return. It even schedules therapy sessions for you. This is representative of how technological and industrial advancements empower us to shape reality the way we want. And I think it's created arrogance. Are you tired of texting someone? You can ignore their messages or even block them, and it will seem as though they aren't texting you. We're eventually going to run out of natural resources? Nonsense, we will have a solution for when the time comes. We think we know so much and are used to having things so easily that we cannot deal with authentic reality when it opposes our wishful control. It prevents the development and capacity for critical thinking. Even when Professor Mindy tells President Orlean that there is a 99 point like 97% accuracy of their calculations, her response is call it 70% and let's just let's move on. The authentic reality of the comet doesn't fit into the reality she has planned, which is to win midterm elections. It is only when she sees the comet as fitting into her inauthentic reality that she accepts the comet as happening. The more anxious we feel about our fundamental freedom and its endless possibilities, the more we resort to defense mechanisms, such as projection or denial. The movie will be released the day that some believe Comet Dibiaski will impact the planet. I love Devin Peters. Yeah. Great. Everything he does. And our society is an anxiety-producing machine. Many of us in developed countries have an unimaginable number of options available to us in every aspect of our lives. When we go to the grocery store to buy a loaf of bread, we don't just have white bread and whole wheat bread. We have rye, 14 grain, oat, gluten-free, cornbread, cheese bread, you name it. In the modern dating era, the pool of potential partners is no longer limited to just the people that you interact with in real life. You can swipe endlessly on Tinder or slide into someone's DMs who lives halfway across the world. All the advancements that we have gone through is wonderful in the sense that we no longer have to face scarcity, but it has created a new problem, the paradox of choice. We have too many choices and it makes us feel freedom too strongly. When there is a limited number of choices, we can be more sure about what we want, less worried that we made the wrong choice. When there are so many possibilities, we experience anxious thoughts such as, did I make the right choice? Could the other option have been better? We deal with this paradox of choice when it comes to information. We are presented with so much information. How do we decide which source to trust? Is the Washington Post correct? Or should I listen more to this article from The Guardian? Is don't look up right? Or is just look up right? Perhaps I should be a centrist like Chris Evans so that I don't have to choose. Or I will just ignore the information and focus on fun things that don't worry me instead, such as which celebrities are getting back together. It becomes even more complicated when we remember that so much information presented to us has been manipulated. Professor Mindy becomes a mouthpiece for the government. He has ethos as an astronomy professor and is apparently America's sexiest scientist, making him very effective at gaining citizens' trust. This whole sequence right here, we see how the president and her son are talking about how they're going to orchestrate the whole announcement of the comet and their plans 
hands to take it out. They pretend to have a hero when really no human is involved in operating the technology. They have rows of American flags blowing in the wind, red blue fireworks, a stars and stripes stage to also present the American president as a great hero. It reminds me very much of when President George Bush gave his end of the Iraq war speech. He came flying down on a navy jet and was wearing a military flight suit, painting an image of personal connection to the civilians in the military. Plus, as the podcast Spin Cycles Part 5 says, no president in the 20th century had ever been photographed wearing a military uniform. But why look like a president when you can look like Tom Cruise in Top Gun? It is so hard to live authentically when we are constantly presented with inauthenticity. Yeah. Thousand bucks a when we live in an age of manipulative public relations and advertising, we develop distrust. Are you trying to sell me something? Twist the story in some way? Or are you being authentic? I can't remember if I mentioned David Foster Wallace in my Gen Z humor video, but he is well known for speaking about postmodern irony and a transition to sincerity. Postmodernism focused a lot on deconstruction, recognizing everything as a social construction, rejecting absolutes, the feeling that nothing is sincere and your individual perspective is all that you can really know. This brought about irony, cynicism, and self-reference in the media. More TV shows started to criticize themselves. More advertisements would acknowledge their own disingenuous intentions in the advertisement. You know what you should try? To trust random people on the internet with all of your savings. <laughs> Is this script for real? Self-deprecation became popular. Combine this with living in a culture of consumerism, which has led us to develop a, quote, marketing reflex, an inbuilt early warning system that detects incoming commercial messages. They no longer read ads innocently, but look behind them, as it were, to see what the advertiser's up to. The song Sincerity is Scary by the 1975 has some great lyrics about the fear of sincerity as well. Oh, irony is okay, I suppose. Culture is to blame. You try and mask your pain in the most postmodern way. You lack substance when you say something like, oh, what a shame. It's just a self-referential way that stops you from having to be human. We find it hard to think of others as being sincere, and we also find it harder to be sincere ourselves. It's like a defense mechanism. If you are too trusting, you might be taken advantage of or be called naive. It's also a way to cope, because as mentioned in the previous section, authentic reality is often scary to face. When Kate has an outburst on television, when we're all 100% for sure gonna f***ing die! People make memes of her, ridiculing her complete and utter sincerity. Perhaps they think her outburst was staged. Or I think it's more likely that society prefers people who are calm, collected, and optimistic, like the TV show hosts of The Daily Rip, that can always turn situations into laughter and discourage strong, raw emotion, particularly anger. Hey. Is she always like that? <laughs> Which is understandable because no one enjoys being yelled at or feeling like they are to blame for something, similar to how a lot of people complained about this film being too self-righteous. But we can't only swallow bad news when it's presented in an ironic or sarcastic way to humor us. We should be able to deal with bad news in its sincere form. And I know some people would argue that Nowadays, we are a lot more open with our emotions and hardships, but I don't know if that's the case. A lot of online posts I find that are about emotional or vulnerable topics are done in an ironic fashion. While irony is good at pointing out flaws, its downfall is that it provides no solution to take its place once the flaws have been pointed out. In his work on the concept of irony, Kierkegaard wrote, Here then, we have irony as the infinite absolute negativity. It is negativity because it only negates. Irony establishes nothing because that which is to be established lies behind it. So make as many memes as you want about Kate. You can belittle her for maybe throwing a fit on national TV. Maybe she should have been more collected, but now what? Ironic memes don't tell us what to actually do after the problem has been pointed out. 
And so, in a world fearful of authenticity and sincerity, how are we ever supposed to face an awful reality when we fail to accept frightening but sincere emotions, when we are scared to exercise our inherent freedom, and when there are barriers to doing so? It is. We, we really... We really did have everything, didn't we? I know Don't Look Up was created with climate change in mind, but I see it as representative of the way society reacts to a lot of negative but truly important news. I honestly didn't mind that it was boring or slow at some parts, like some people felt. I've been learning to appreciate the more slow and mundane parts of movies, because that's more like what real life is. Stopping a comet is not an action-filled Hollywood blockbuster. It is also full of waiting, boring conversations with people, and messiness. This is the first time I've ever talked about a film on this channel, so you can leave me feedback down below. You know, I would love to hear your thoughts on this, thoughts about how this video was. Like and subscribe if you want, I would really appreciate that. Thank you so much for watching. Let's keep talking and I hope to hear from you soon. Bye!